What happens when a guy who was incarcerated for 23 years of his life, 10 years behind physical bars, the rest were the bars that I placed around my heart. See, I believed the lie, so totally I was deceived. Then I encountered the power of the cross. I got saved, so I wrote a book, and it's called Prison Break. Guess what? It's time for you to be set free. It's a 21-day devotional that's going to help you hear the voice of God to set you free. You know, when I read stuff like Jesus set the captives free, I'm always thinking, did he just walk up to the local jail and tell everybody to get out? That's not what he did. He actually wanted to set the captives free from the lies they believe. This is a 21-day journey that I believe you need to get on. Man, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. First of all, thank you so much, everyone. Um, keep our pastors in prayer. They are on rest. They are on their sabbatical. And so we love pastors who come back refreshed and renewed. And so we celebrate with them as they take this time. So give them a hand because they're so, so great in pouring into each one of our lives and to each one of our families as well. And uh, I want to thank you all also, because during the summer months, usually we get caught up in the things and the activities and, you know, going places and vacation. Um, but because of your generous giving, we're able to continue to expand our kids' side and renovate it and bring new and improved things to all of our kids' area. So all of our babies up until fifth grade, every single Sunday, you guys know that we reach almost 100 children every single Sunday, every single Sunday. And so they're getting uh, new, all sorts of new equipment and renovations. You guys saw the iPads, the computers, and just our, our wonderful children's ministry is doing a phenomenal job. So thank you. Because of your giving, don't stop being generous. We are able to bless the next generation. And if you ever need any encouragement, I challenge you to go into that kids class and ask one of them little ones to teach you some scripture because I'm sure they will beat some of us here in this place. Yes or no? <clears throat> so for those who don't know, my name is Pastor Stephanie. I am uh, one of the pastors here. I want to thank every one of you guys for showing up today. We know that the summer months can get a little bit filled with our calendars and our schedule. And, you know, in this time, Pastor's given us, given me the opportunity to share a message with you all. And so I'm excited because we have been in the series Bear Fruit. Everyone say Bear Fruit. Bear fruit. And so I'm ending today with the last fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Everyone say self-control. Self Everyone laughed because that's our favorite thing to do, right? <laughs> Not really, right? It's it's, uh, it's hard because we're lovers of self by nature, you know? We're born into this flesh, and so we're living in an era of self-gratification, of self-elevation, even selfies, right? Can't, can't escape those at all. And we even go so far as to self-diagnose. How many of you have been guilty of being like, I am so OCD? When we think of self-control, we often think of like discipline and diets and working out and working hard or maybe not going off on that person at work who really got under your skin. <laughs> we can relate to that. I, I understand. And so today we're going to cover self-control, but we're going to learn from the word of God. Is that all right with y'all? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today, Lord. We pray that we continue to do a work that you continue to do a work in each and every single one of us, Lord. May our resounding yes to your word bear fruit in our lives, in our speech, in our families, and how we reflect Jesus in everywhere that we go, in our actions, in our thoughts. Lord, we ask that you teach us your truth. Holy Spirit, we welcome you and we ask that it be your message and not our own. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So my goal for us today, guys, is very simple. I hope that we walk away knowing self-control is only made possible by the Spirit of God. Any efforts at self-control without the Spirit of God are merely actions taken to achieve our personal satisfaction or pleasure. I know it may not seem that way when we're doing things that go the opposite of our desires. We're doing things like working hard and, and maybe going on a healthy diet or exercising a bit more or biting our tongue when we think that we have something better to say. 
But in the end, if we are not bearing the fruit of self-control in line with the Spirit of God, it's ultimately to gratify your own pleasure and your own desires. You see, some of you might have a coworker that appears like they're in control because his or her career is all about staying late, coming in early, a little bit of overtime. But what we may not see is that coworker may have lost control of their finances. Maybe that coworker lacks time management and doesn't know how to set boundaries, yet we see them as someone who displays the fruit of self-control. A quiet, well-behaved teenager appears in control of their tongue, but maybe they lack the ability to express their emotions, and they face an adulthood of rebellion. We often think, oh, well, they're so well-behaved. Oh, I wish my son or my daughter were like them. Yet inside, there may be a well of bitterness, a well of resentment. There's a saying in Spanish, calladita se ve más bonita. That means when your mouth is closed, you look prettier. And some of us have instilled that culture into our children, into our young ones. Yet that fruit of flesh self-control is bearing a fruit of bitterness and resentment. How many gym rats do we have here? Come on. You workout people? All right. Y'all are loud and proud. <laughs> a lot of times we see our gym friends or our healthy you know, family member that you went to 4th of July and they had a plate that looked like it was for a two-year-old. And you're like, what on earth? They've got so much self-control. But let me tell you, that discipline that you see might be fueled by pride. Today, I want to talk to us as a whole, not as a you versus me, but I find myself in a lot of what I want to share today because there's some questions that I feel that we should ask ourselves. So if you're taking notes, the first question is, what does self-control look like in my life? Is there fruit of the flesh or fruit of the spirit in my life? Do I have self-control or am I lacking self-control at home, at work, in relationships? You see, sometimes we get really good at one aspect of our life. Maybe you're one of those people who's got the greatest work ethic. And if it's for work, oh, you'll show up early, you'll stay late. But if it's for church, you're going to get here late. You to look at the calendar. You avoid the person who's making the schedule. Oh, no, don't look at me. <laughs> but we pride ourselves in that work ethic. But then maybe at home, we're neglecting our family. Maybe we're not spending time with our little ones or spending time in our word and seeking him before we make decisions, even in our workplaces. You see, I was praying and I was asking the Lord about this message and I really felt the need to simplify the language because uh, we use a lot of spirit and flesh and I grew up in church and so things like that are easy for me to hear, easy for me to say, like, die to your flesh and be led by the spirit. But if you're new in your walk, I'll be honest, you get pretty lost in translation. You're like, what do you mean flesh? What are you talking about? And so it was really awesome whenever I found this article on uh, the American Psychological Association, and they were discussing the topic and the studies on self-control and the act of exerting it, which they call willpower. So I want to share this with you all. This is not religious people. This is a study that they did, completely medicinal and nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, but it's about self-control. It says, many studies have found that people perform relatively poor on tests of self-control when they have engaged in a previous, seemingly unrelated, act of self-control. For instance, in a study they did, they invited some students to eat fresh baked chocolate chip cookies and asked the others to resist the cookies and munch on radishes. I don't know about you, but I'll pick chocolate chip cookies over radishes 
any day. Then we gave them impossible geometry puzzles to solve. The students who ate the cookies had resisted the students who ate the cookies worked on the puzzle for 20 minutes on average. But the students who had resisted the tempting cookies gave up after an average of just eight minutes. That's less than half the time that they would have spent, they would have indulged if they wouldn't have surrendered that self-control. You see, a dieter may easily avoid a donut for breakfast. Not here, right? People be bringing donuts all the time. But after a long day of making difficult decisions at work, he has a much harder time resisting that piece of cake for dessert. Anybody ever been like, man, I ate salad all week. I deserve this cake, this cheesecake, this bag of Cheetos. You know what I mean? That's, that's guilty, you know? <laughs> and so after a long day at work, making decisions after decisions, he has a much harder time resisting that piece of cake for dessert. Another example might be losing your temper. Normally, you refrain from responding negatively to unpleasant things that your partner might say. Any married people in the building? Raise your hand. Come on. Anybody, anybody married who have a partner who says something crazy? Don't raise your hand. Oh, what? Come on. You should. But if one day you're especially depleted, maybe you're trying to meet a stressful work deadline, and the person says precisely the wrong thing, you erupt and say the words you would have stifled if your self-control was at full capacity. See, most of the problems that plague our modern individuals in our society, addiction, overeating, crime, domestic violence, sexually transmitted diseases, prejudice, debt, unwanted pregnancy, Underperformance at school and work, educational failure, lack of savings, failure to exercise, all have some degree of self-control failure as the central aspect. Now, this isn't, this isn't scripture. This is studies that they've done on us as living humans, that when we start making those decisions and we start exerting that willpower, that self-control in our own strength, it's a limited resource. It can only go so long. You end up binge eating. You end up cussing somebody out, maybe in traffic or maybe on the phone because it's all in your strength. It's not in the Lord's. So my second question to us is, why do you think that is? Why do we fail at self-control? Now, before we get into the control aspect of it, I believe we have to pause and take a look at self. You see, the self in self-control is very, very important because a lot of us struggle with the identity of self. We, we live in an era where anyone can be anything. We've heard it a thousand times, but way beyond the male and female aspect of it, a lot of us have taken on the identity of self where we were raised. You see, I'm going to share some examples, and maybe you find yourself in these, so I hope I don't ruffle too many feathers, but it's the Lord's word, not mine. So maybe you were raised in a single-parent household, and so you self-identify as independent. I don't need help. I don't need anyone. I've never had anyone. I won't need anyone at all. I did this on my own. They weren't there for me then. They're not going to be there for me now. So that's the identity that you have taken on as independent. They made a whole song about it. Don't sing it. Maybe you were raised in an athletic sports family. Where are my athletes at? Come on, championship group. Uh-huh. Let's go, Colombia. Just one. Come on. That's me right there. And so you identify as competitors. Everything is a comparison. You see someone walk in the room, you're already sizing them up. Ah, I could tackle them, I could put them down. My jump shot's way better than his, and I don't know any other sports terms because that's all my husband. <laughs> everything is comparison, everything is statistics, everything is wins and losses. There's no in between. I either made it or I failed. Maybe you grew up with great working parents. That's me right here. Come on, be proud of your parents. They provided a house, food, clothes, everything. 
And so you identify as this hard worker and you pride yourself in it. Nobody's going to outwork you. Nobody's going to put more hours in than you. These new guys, they don't know how easy they've got it. (laughs) But what if we've gained everything in our own efforts? Some of us still have maybe experienced a life of addiction, of trauma, of poverty, things that were out of our own control, not our own doing. And so then we take on the identity of our environment and we become victims. And we say, well, if it wasn't for my parents or if it wasn't for my family and if it wasn't for the neighborhood and this person did this to me and they said this about me and if they wouldn't have just shared their wealth over there and these people are, I don't know what. But then in that same environment, we can take on the identity of a hardened heart. And we vow to never be like that again. Well, I'm not going to be like my parents, and I'm not going to be like my mom and my dad, and I will never be broke again. And so we're so driven that success will be achieved at any cost. The cost of your family, the cost of your children, the cost of your relationship with Christ, the cost of your values. You'll cheat, you'll lie, anything to not be like what you came from. And we take that identity on. Those are inner vows. You can look for a sermon series on that somewhere else. And yet some of us, like myself, were raised in religion and church. Any church babies in here? Come on. Mm -hmm, That woo-woo was a little bit more quiet. (laughs) But we take on the image of a Christian. Keyword, image of a Christian but our lifestyle does not bear any fruit of it. We go to the church, anytime that it's open, you're serving 15 times a week, you know, you're on like 30 teams and and nobody can tell you to take a day off. You're at every conference, every concert, every (laughs) t-shirt, every podcast. (laughs) But your fruit isn't authentic. It's the fake fruit. You've heard Pastor Juan talk about the little grape, squishy grape that you chew, yeah. Or what's going on right now, right, where they say all the produce, it's like a bendy banana. They're like, what are they feeding us? That's what we look like. I wish I had a banana for you, girl. I don't. Sorry. See, I don't know where you find yourself in some of those examples, but I know for me, I really struggled with that last one. As many of you know, I'm the youngest of four. And so, any babies in the building? Come on, where are the babies at? I know, we're proud. We're so happy, we're spoiled, we're like, we're the best. But if we're honest, our parents were probably just tired by the the time they got to us. You know what I mean? (laughs) But I'm so grateful because I had some parents that just really instilled faith into our lives. We prayed every night, and you guys have heard the stories before, and... Man, as the youngest child, I got to witness my parents and my siblings overcome a lot of challenges. You see, I witnessed them in a lot of difficult situations, and I prided myself on, well, I'm not going to do what they did because, you know, she got in trouble, and he's grounded, and then he didn't get his license till I don't know when, and so I was like, you know what? I'm going to avoid those mistakes because I'm watching. And so I've got an older brother, his name's Josue, he's only a year older than me, and he was the only boy. So he gave my parents a run for their money when it came to pushing the boundaries. How many of y'all know boy dads, they can be difficult? Well, my brother taught me how to sneak out of the house in high school using a refrigerator magnet. (laughs) Don't try it now, kids, because they got ring cameras everywhere. (laughs) Now, all the years of front row seat ticket that I had to the trials and the challenges that my siblings faced as teenagers and even going into their young adult life, I felt really proud of my moral accomplishments. You see, I didn't get in trouble at school. I didn't get in trouble with boys. I kept good grades. I had a part-time job. I paid my bills, put gas in my car, X, Y, Z, et cetera. Parents, don't look to your teenagers. Because you're like, see, I told you you need to get a summer job. Now, after that first time of sneaking out 
of my parents' house. We went to the country where I drank my first cup of jungle juice. Y'all know what that is? AKA a plastic tub with cheap alcohol and fruit punch. You see, that night, the battle of flesh versus spirit really began in my life. As the parties increased and I joined my brother and our friends more and more and more, the boys came into my life. The lies followed suit. And all the years of going to church, reading our word, serving in a youth group, came to the test with my newfound stolen freedom. You see, to the outsider, it seemed as though, well, my good grades, my well-spoken demeanor, and my great work ethic, it looked so much better than the wild, partying, outgoing, drinking and smoking in your face life that my brother had. But in all reality, we were the same. The difference is that I carried Christian as my identity, but not as my lifestyle. You see, the lust of the flesh beat my self-control every single time. Every single time. But as long as I showed up to church, and it was Spanish church, so we had to be there at one. You know I slept in. We partied till six. And I'm like, we got to go. We got to go to church. As long as I showed up on time, I went to church. I played the Christian CDs in my Ford Explorer. I was better than them. You see, I probably didn't say it, but in my heart, I felt it and I believed it. And so the identity that I carried was one that was self-made. Finally, one day, some time after I had partied for a while and, you know, the Lord really, really spoke to me and he's like, Steph, you got to stop doing that. And I started making my way back to church and back to Christ. I was living with my parents at the time and I don't remember what the argument was, but I remember I left upset. And I was arguing with my dad, and he punished me for talking back and being rude. <laughs> Y'all know, sometimes the girls, they be having a mouth on the, that was me. And in true, young, spoiled fashion, I pointed out, well, why am I getting punished if Josue is in the room smoking weed? We can smell it. All I did was have some attitude. And you know what he told me? It's not about you. It's not about him. This is about you. I remember my dad telling me that, and it took a long time for me to really learn that lesson. For years, I walked in pride because I hid my sin. See, I lied about the extent of my partying to my parents. I regularly indulged in drunkenness And in my sober mind, I put on the greatest disguise of a spirit-filled Christian. My identity was self-made. That's why, you know, my husband and I, we oversee the student ministry and man. You're lucky we've been through some things because your kids can't get it past us. (laughs) We're like, we know, girl. I always tell people that back, back then, I know I'm not the oldest person in the room, but I'm up there. You know, we had to pay for text messages. I remember that. And so I found out that my parents had 200 free text messages in their plan. They didn't know that. So what I would do is I would text my friends and text the boys and do all these different things. And then I'd look on their phone bill on the Internet, make sure that I wasn't over the 200. Because then they would find out. So now with the technologies that we have, man, we got our eyes on you guys. But you see, my identity was self-made. It was all because of my own achievements and my own lies and my own deception. So why does any of this matter? Because I believe in order for us to attain the only true self-control is by relinquishing our made-up image of self and take on the identity that God has bestowed on us. So who does God say that I am? You see, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it reads, This means that anyone, some people, who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 
I'm not the one to get into the Greek and the Aramaic and the, all that. I'm gonna leave that up to Pastor Todd and Pastor Tanya because they're way better at it than I am. And you're not gonna hear me say much of this again. But the word new in this verse, woo, it just spoke huge to me. The word new in this verse is translated from the word kainos, which means never been made before. So that's a different kind of new, not the new to me, the car with 100,000 miles and I put a paint job over it and so it's new, or the house that we got that's you know built in 1970s but they threw new cabinets up there and some pretty backsplash and they're like, new house. Not the same kind of new. This new means that He's not cleaning up our old self with a second coat of paint. He gives us a brand new life. Brand new life. You see, why is this important? We're talking about self-control and stuff. You keep saying all these other things. See, for me, the fact that I exhibited self-control in some areas but had no fruit to show for it tells me self-control was fueled by self and not the spirit of God. It was artificial fruit. Now, I won't go into all of the details. I'm sure there's plenty of podcasts and different YouTubes where I share some of my story, but this artificial fruit led me down to the false self-control that I carried, and it really demonstrated my lack in trusting God. You see, I struggled a lot with control most Women do. I needed things to go my way in relationships and finances and jobs and careers and my family. If you ask anyone, they, they got some type of nickname for me. Boss, this, that, hey, I, I don't know, sheriff, I think they say over there. And I told my parents, it's not bossy, it's leadership skills. Um, <laughs> But you see, submitted unto the flesh, that's bossy. Submitted unto the spirit, that's leadership. You know, the work that my husband Jonathan and I put in to have the incredible marriage that we have today is only because we both surrendered control and submitted to the spirit of God. Jonathan and I started dating about four years ago, and I like to call that I was in my peak single era. Where are the single people at? Single people. All right, three of y'all. Okay. <laughs> bring your friends and bring your friends. <laughs> now there was a time that I'll let him tell his version of the story, but I told him straight to his face when we were just friends. I said, you are not the only guy that I'm talking to and you are not the only guy that's interested in me. And I didn't mean it in the way that you guys are thinking it. I mean it in the I had fully surrendered control of my desire to be in a relationship for the first time in my life. You see, I was what I like to call a serial relationship person. You wouldn't see me with 10 different guys, but you see me with one guy for a year and then another guy for a year and then another guy, so on and so forth. And then you can look for the singleness conversations because that's something I'm very passionate about. But you see, in that time, I understood it meant that in the way that no matter what I had done, no matter what had been done to me, I had to give God my whole life. Even my expectations, even my career, even my future. The Lord spoke to me in ways that I really needed to open up my eyes to the flesh that I still had in me. My identity was no longer based on my own desires and satisfactions. The word of God in Galatians 5, to 26, you guys should know it by now. This is the last sermon of the series. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, say it with me, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Good job, guys. Come on. It says, the law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, 
envying one another. You see, the whole message that Paul is giving the Galatians in this book is because they believe that they could live out the fruit of the Spirit in their own strength. How many of you have tried life in your way? You see, the devil will try to convince you that you can figure out life on your own, that you can carry and walk out the fruit of the Spirit in your own strength. That's deceptions, my friend. When we practice self-control in the flesh, we give ourselves the glory. Well, it's because of me. You see this car I have, this house I have, You see my beautiful family over here? That's me, because I work hard. Or you see these titles, these accolades, these prizes, these accomplishments? That's because of me, not because of anything that was done to me, not because of anything anyone gave me. I earned this, I deserved it, and I'm proud of it. You see, when we practice self-control in the spirit, we give Christ the glory. In Proverbs 18, 12, it says, Haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. So we have to come to a place of humility. We have to humble ourselves to say, man, you know what? God could have done it without me. But how more, how much more grateful am I that he chose me to be a vessel in the gifts that he has bestowed so that we can continue to build his kingdom? John 5.30 says, I can do nothing on my own. Some things? Your career? Your finances? Your family? The children you're believing for? Wow. it's a good one, parents. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You see, in that study that they did, the power, the willpower that they called, they tested and they put the chocolate chip cookies in front. In our own strength, it's a limited resource. We can only do so much. And that's not even like biblical people. That's medical doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists and people who studied the humans as they behave in their natural born flesh. But if we go back to that scripture and we read and we meditate on that word new, it means we're not coming in with our old life and our old baggage. God has thrown out everything and he's given us a new life. And so sometimes what we do is that we We take little pockets and closets of our lives and we hide them and we say, Lord, you can have this, but I do this part better. Lord, you can can take my finances, Lord, but my tongue, mm -mm mm-mm-mm, that's me. Lord, you can take my job, but my family, no, no, no. That's, That's for me to do. See, I want us to leave with an understanding that discipline, healthy lifestyles, good work ethic, none of those things are bad on their own. If anything, us as believers should be the example to the world and be the best at those than everyone else who does not bear the spirit of God. But my hope for us today is that we reflect and we ask ourselves, have we taken the glory away from Christ? Have we put our desires before the will of the Lord? And how can we exhibit self-control if we have not rid our lives of self? There was a series of studies led by Kathleen Voss, a psychologist at the University of Minnesota. She found that the depletion of what they called this, this ego makes all manner of emotions and desires be felt more strongly than usual. People with a depleted ego reported stronger reactions to both pleasant and unpleasant images, for example, and also seem to experience physical pain more intensely. If you've been doing life on your own, if you've been trying to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, exhibit self-control, goodness, faithfulness, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of the above, 
without the Spirit of God. It says the depletion has no signature feeling, but it seems to be like turning up the volume on your life as a whole. How many of you have ever felt like life is just so loud? You've got career, you've got finances, you've got marriage, you've got all these things that have replaced the voice of God in our lives. And so as I close, I want us to think about some things. See, you might be where I was, where you've surrendered some areas of your life and you've given God control of them, but you're holding on to something that isn't of the Spirit. You're saying, Lord, I trust you with this, but not with this. Or maybe you pride yourself in the self-control that you exhibit at work, at home, with your family, in your schools. And you go in with a puffed up chest and you say, yep, that's all me. It's time for us to give him back his glory. That scripture or that that study that they did where they said the volume just in your whole life turns up so loud i feel that that really spoke to us in a certain time like this where we've got media and we've got voices and everyone's got an opinion and a thousand preachers that you can find just by the touch of a button on your phone but the word the truth the living word that god puts in our face we neglect it and we say, no, I don't have to exhibit this fruit. Who's going who's gonna to check the fruit and make sure that it's real? If everything appears nice, then I don't have to rearrange the things inside. So I want to invite you to stand up to your feet. I know that there's people in here who've been feeling like you've been doing your Christian life in your own strength. We've got people here who want to pray for you. This community, this family, I mean, you guys should have seen me in the, in the morning. It's nervous beyond words. But what really made those nerves go away was just seeing each and every single one of you guys. Because you see, it's a community, it's the family, it's the body of Christ that brings us back into alignment whenever we go off track and we say, no, 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 it's because of me or it's because of my past and it's because of this and we take on these identities of self that God hasn't called us. When he's called you a son, when he's called you a daughter, when he's called you redeemed, forgiven, and restored. So if you've been feeling like you've been doing this on your own, I want you to come up and have someone pray for you. And maybe you're here and you've taken that fruit and you're like, man, they call me fruit of the loom. I got all of them. I'm patient, but inside you're like, oh. I'm kind, but to the side, you're like, you see what I did for them? You know, if I hadn't, I've got joy, but then you're over there drinking bottles filled with a different spirit. And so we've taken, maybe you've taken the fruit of self-control and made it about you. I, I invite you to come up and return that glory back to the Father of where it belongs because only he is worthy. It's only because of his goodness that we can be good. It's only because of his faithfulness that we can be faithful. And it's only because of the self-identity that we have agreed upon as he has bestowed it on us as Christ's followers that we can exhibit self-control. And so my prayer is that we seek his forgiveness on the areas that we have fallen short. That we put him first in all the gifts because you guys are talented, gifted, 
smart individuals, no matter what anyone has ever told you. But the gifts and the fruit are only there for his glory and not our own. So, Father, I want to pray for us today, God, for every single heart here, Lord, that has said yes to your truth in their life, that has surrendered their control, their will, and their desires so that all that's left is your will and your will alone. Lord, restore the things that were stolen, taken, hidden, deceived, broken. Move in a mighty way because of who you are and not because of who we are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.